Good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Pete, and I'm here with you uh, for another Friday release of my vlog. And uh, I either will release a live video or I will release something that, that has been uh, pre-produced. And it kind of depends when, I, whichever way I go, depending on how I feel or what kind of production I want to do that week. Uh, today's subject has to do with hyperuricemia. And the impetus to do this video came from uh, a comment on my YouTube channel uh, by, by one of my subscribers who was asking the question about uh, reducing the risk of gout. Uh, and we can look at this two different ways, right? We can reduce the risk of gout and other chronic diseases that are related to uric acid by either going after the production aspect of it, you know, how uric acid is being produced and then gets into the circulatory system, or at the kidney level, how it's being processed. And with, with the ultimate question, uh, can we increase the amount of excretion in, of uric acid in, into the urine. And so I want to try and start addressing that today. And I say try because I, I have been uber focused on the intracellular effect of uric acid uh, for literally the last year and a half, because I really think this is where the business end of this, the influence of uric acid on chronic disease is. And we've done a lot of videos in this area, the gout hypothesis, the fact that it uh, that intracellular uric acid drives insulin resistance and all these different things. And the reason why I have stepped back from the hyperuricemia question is because it's actually quite complicated and, and the data in surrounding hyperuricemia is uh, less easy to sort out, quite frankly, because circulating uric acid, we evolved in to as humans to producing more uric acid millions of years ago. And one of the arguments for an increased level of uric acid in the circulatory system is the fact that it's an antiox antioxidant and that it has functions that way. And I'm not arguing against that. It's clear cut. The data for that is clear cut. It's solid data. But the question I have is where's the threshold, right? Uh, I'm a PhD biochemist. I've spent my whole life uh, studying and thinking about what goes on inside the cell. And when we move outside the cell, things get a lot more complicated because, uh, because it's a much more complicated system. And the antioxidant effect of uric acid is definitely important, but one concept in biology that holds up always is the idea that all of these important molecules like uric acid, which has not only the antioxidant capabilities, but it's also a signaling molecule and its level of concentration is going to matter. And so the question becomes how much uric acid in the circulatory system is too much? How much do we need for it to operate as an effective antioxidant? And I, I'm not, I'm here today to tell you, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that if you're a gout sufferer and you eliminate the hyperglycemia, the alcohol and the input of fructose as a first level of defense, and you look at whether or not your system has improved. And by the way, this is the first thing that you want to do if you're suffering from diabetes or severe obesity or cardiovascular disease. Those are the first three things to do. Get the hyperglycemia out of your life. Lower the fructose. That's the input of sugar, right? That comes from a lot of different places. And stop with the alcohol, right? And I've talked extensively about the effect of alcohol on on. on the system and its relationship to uric acid. And then after that, you need to look at your system, your system, and ask the question, uh, what is my health from a metabolic point of view, right? And you can do extensive blood work to sort that out. And you need to do it 
And I've talked about this in a lot of pr presentations because of the overlap. Like if you're a gout sufferer, the likelihood that you're not also having issues with something else like chronic kidney disease, um, comorbidities with obesity, the, um, the cardiovascular disease and the diabetes issue is really slim because the gout issue itself, even though it's a pinnacle issue, I think, is systemic. And that means that it's interlocked or interrelated with all these other factors. And wh what I'm getting around to saying is that once you've eliminated the sugar, the alcohol, and you've, you've brought the glucose down so you're not having hyperglycemic, chronically hyperglycemic meals, you may end up needing to also do more thinking about the carbohydrate intake that's in your lifestyle. That's a possibility. And the only way to know the answer to that is to look at your metabolics. So how does this relate to what we're talking about today? Because in a gout sufferer, if you do everything that I just talked about, and you're still hyperuricemic, so you're running uric acid greater than seven. And in my own case, remember my story, right? I've, I've reversed prediabetes. I put my gout in remission. And then after, literally after a year and a half of being compliant in my lifestyle, being very careful, I was still running uric acid that was greater than seven. It, my average is between seven and eight. You know, uh, if I had alcohol, of course, it, it would go up substantially. Um, if, if I allowed uh, myself to have a hyperglycemic meal, then I would see, again, the uric acid coming back up again. This is the fructose metabolism right? Which seems to be strong in those of us who, who um, have multiple metabolic issues. So the question of the hyperuricemia is, is prevalent. What can we do for those of us that want to bring it down? And we really have to look at uh, of two issues. We have to look at the production because as it turns out, the production is the biggest part of this. It's the thing you really have to push back on, right? You need to get the uric acid down. And if you read Dr. Richard Johnson, if you read David uh, Perlmutter, they talk about how you need to get uric acid down. And when you listen to a lot of their stuff on YouTube, the number that they seem to be comfortable with is around 5.5 megs per deciliter as a target for uric acid. And that's where I've got mine, uh, my uric acid at, at the moment. Then you can also think about the excretion thing. But again, as we go into this, and I know I'm somewhat long-winded, remember what, what I have talked about over and over and over again. First comes eliminating the main drivers of this. That's the sugar the alcohol and the hyperglycemia, right? And eating real food, whole food that we cut up and we cook. Getting established in that stable lifestyle, right? Which includes other things too. I, I, I won't get off on a tangent, but stable lifestyle. Then after stability, asking the question about the hyper uh, uricemia, right? And that's where we are now. So let's go ahead and dive in. For those of you that are joining me, Right now, um, if you have questions, absolutely put them in the chat and I will get to them as soon as we were finished with uh, this short presentation. So here we are today. All right, so we're gonna be focused on the kidneys because this is where the action is in regard to the reabsorption of uric acid from the circulatory system um, and the excretion, right? The balance of those two things, again, the circulating uric acid, therefore, is controlled by these two major issues. The production on the one hand, which is coming from various organs, mainly the, the liver as sitting at the top of this, right? This is, this is the BAMO organ, right? It's the one that is, that is uh, producing and pushing uric acid in the circulatory system more than any other organ, uh, which is generating the uricemia in the blood supply. And then we have the question of the excretion. So let's boil this down to what the reality is. 
So of the uric acid that is circulating, that is filtered by the kidneys, it's going to be filtered in the glomerulus. And 90% of the uric acid that's pushed into the tubules is going to be re reabsorbed by the proximal tubules and put back into the circulatory system. Remember that. Of only about 10% of the uric acid that is reaching the kidneys overall, overall, is going to be uh, actually excreted and, and uh, appear in the urine and then flush down the toilet. Of the uric acid that is going to be excreted, which is relatively small compared to the production value coming out of the liver, 60 to 70% of that is going to end up in your urine. And the other 30 to 40% is going to be excreted by the intestine. So in today's discussion, we're talking about the level of excretion at the kidney. And we're focused on that. But to talk about that, we also have to focus on, pr on production. But we're, we need to focus on that aspect relative to what is going on with kidneys. So most of you have seen this diagram before. This is basically the survival switch that Dr. Richard Johnson has talked a lot about in his new book, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. I also provide another reference here because now... Instead of talking about liver, we're specifically going to focus on fructose metabolism in the kidney. And yes, people, the, the kidney do, undergoes uh, fructose metabolism. And you'll notice in this, sorry, I'm looking at my notes because I always forget stuff. And there's something I'm going to want to talk about here uh, briefly. So the main two co contributors to what I'm going to call uh, intracellular production of uric acid. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is in today's discussion, we're going to talk about how uric acid can also elicit signaling effects relative to this important metabolic pathway by coming into the proximal, uh, proximal tubule cells of the kidney. Re remember, that month after month, when I've talked about this pathway, I've focused on how we can have exogenous fructose coming in from the diet and we can have hyperglycemia, which I'm showing here. One aspect of this in the kidney is that the alcohol is not going to be metabolized here like it is in the liver because in the kidney, the kidney is missing uh, an important enzyme for alcohol degradation called alcohol dehydrogen, dehydrogenase. And you'll notice that it's not li listed here, therefore, on the front end of this uh, metabolism. Now, as I say that, there's two caveats to this that I could not find data on that are open questions about the effect of alcohol. The first is, and I did this presentation last week, it's on my YouTube channel, uh, one of the hypotheses about the effect of alcohol on fructose metabolism is that alcohol can um, activate aldose reductase uh, directly. I, I don't know the outcome of that. I don't know the answer to it. And whether or not alcohol is having that kind of an effect here is, as far as I'm concerned, is unknown um, because I haven't seen any data for it. But the second thing that I know darn well that happens when you drink alcohol is it's going to change the osmolarity of the blood and it will have an effect on the fluids that are going through the kidney. And we know that aldose reductase is activated by, by changes in osmolarity. Uh, the effect, the solute presence of the alcohol in the blood supply, right? It changes this relationship between water and, and the amount of stuff that's dissolved in it and, and how that is perceived by the organs and, and, and whatnot. Also, I've seen no data for that. So, but the effect of alcohol, therefore, I believe is actually an open question on the kidney. Now, coming back to the fructose metabolism, we, we know that exogenous fructose coming in via sugar, um, high fructose corn syrups and so on, um, and hyperglycemia, and again, one of the important things that I think 
that what people like me talk about in this that you need to remember is we're talking about a, a potential meal where, where a large quantity of, of these macronutrients is being ingested over a short, relatively short period of time. And the reason why this matters is that it puts these organs uh, in terms of processing under more stress because they, they now have a lot to do in a short period of time, right? To process these macronutrients coming in. This differentiates the idea where if you had something that you are going to eat that you know has a larger glycemic load and you take a small bite of it and you eat it, right? And then you don't have more of it for a significant period of time and then have another little bit. Your organs are going to be processing this differently. Why? Because you don't have a crap load of this stuff show all showing up. At the same time, you know, you can think of it like going to a movie theater and uh, the, the difference being where you have one person arriving at the doorway to the theater, you know, every 10 or 20 minutes. That's no problem with the people coming in. Right. There's not any processing issue there. But if you have a thousand or two thousand people that all show up at the door at the same time. Now, everything is involved in processing the the input of that is is now at a maximal level right and it it is going to be or can be problematic so that is one thing when we're talking about uh the input of these macronutrients th that's really important to think about from the point of view of uh the difference between pathological processing and and not pr pathological Right. And this is one reason when you read Perlmutter and you read Johnson's stuff, they talk about, you know, if you're going to have a drink of alcohol as an example, this is another example that having a little bit and making sure you push it out over a long period of time is different than slamming that material. Right. That's what we're talking about here. So it's the hyperglycemia and the exogenous fructose. And again, this is going to be processed where the fructose uh, is going to be pushed to fructose 1-phosphate by this enzyme fructokinase, you're going to see the decimation of uh, the ATP pool along with the decimation of phosphate. So the energy within the cell is going to uh, plummet. And we have the sudden acute rise in uric acid, which has its deleterious effects under pathological conditions, right? The elevation of systemic inflammation, the mitochondrial dysfunction, the disruption of the nitric oxide pathways, uh, reprogramming so that we're pushing de novo lipogenesis. And in the kidney in particular, you have a switch to the preference for and activation of the glycolysis pathway. There's even a paper, I think I referenced it here, um, that suggests that that uh, the kidney begins to function uh, uh in regard, in regard to what's called the War, Warburg effect. And, and this particular paper makes an argument for the fructose metabolism driving that. Now, let's turn the tides and talk to talk about, uh, well, first, oh, see, I almost forgot. That's why I put this slide in. So the fructose and the hyperglycemia is not the only place where we're getting, you know, a potential high intracellular production of uric acid. Also, we have protein uh, biochemistry that's going on. There are purine metabolism. And this slide, its purpose is to show you how we get to uric acid from guanosine monophosphate and also from adenosine monophosphate when we're, we're breaking down uh, uh, sources that are coming from uh, cellular sources. All right. So we have protein, we have purine, excuse me, metabolism going on in the kidney. This is another uh, source of, of uh, the production of uric acid. Now, before we get into this next contribution, which I think is really important to talk about, the, the first aspect of this that I just mentioned can, can potentially lead, there is a hypothesis that it can lead to chronic kidney disease, right? Those uric acid effects that are driving low-grade inflammation 
And they're going to be driving this inflammation where? In the proximal tubules of the kidney. And you can see, I put this diagram in so you can understand where these tubules are in a nephron, right? So we have the initial filtration of the blood going on in the glomerulus. The filtrate is going to enter the tubules where, where the stuff that is dissolved, like uric acid um, and other aspect, glucose and fructose and whatnot, can, can be then processed by the kidneys and uh, reabsorbed, as an example. And some of it excreted, can be excreted. In this case, we're talking about, in particular, the uric acid. And the uric acid is going to be pushed into the, into the tubular network, 90, where 90% of it is going to be reabsorbed and put back into the circulatory system. And then uh, a smaller amount of it is going to end up being excreted by the urine. So this slide is to, to, to try and center everyone on what's going on. And the fructose metabolism with the low-grade inflammation where it's going to cause potential damage is in the, in the proximal tubules. And just stop to think about this a minute, because this is where the reabsorption, this is where, where the um, um, excretion of uric acid that eventually is going to end up being peed out in the urine is happening. So if you're damaging the kidney here, then it's not a stretch to understand how that potentially down the road could lead two disruptions of this important uh, outcome of, of the biochemistry, right? So where you could see maybe a decrease in, in the ability of the kidney to, to excrete uric acid. And how is that going to, to affect hyperuricemia? It's going to contribute to elevating it. Now that brings us to this paper that I've referenced down here on the left side. This is an in vitro study that looked at the effect of exogenous, I'm going to call it exogenous uric acid, that's being delivered from outside the proximal tubule cell to the inside. And this is a very important result that we need to talk about. It does have a drawback, and that drawback was that it was an in vitro study. That means done but technically in glass, right in the test tube on human proximal tubule cells. That's a drawback on one hand because it's not in vivo and it's not in human, right? Th this is a study that, th that in the future needs to be pushed on uh, in order to understand what the effect of hyperuricemia could be on proximal tubule function. But the reason why I like this study a lot is that it allowed, and this group did this kind of work, very definitive experiments with really good controls that allowed them to use certain kinds of inhibitors and then to see a, a result, either positive or negative for what they were looking at. And I think it's really important to us because it has uh, strong implications for us in regard to how hyperuricemia could be driving deleterious or negative effects, not only here in a human at the level of the kidney, but other places like the chondrocyte, which is in the joint. And I believe probably has a fundamental role in the gout attack because there's this question of the hyperuricemia. If we have elevated uric acid in the circulatory system, can it make its way, you know, an entry effect into a cell or into an organ. And then if it can come in from the circulatory system, what kind of effects can it have on the cell versus the production of intracellular uric acid in the classical sense that we started talking about here, where fructose and the hyperglycemia at the level of the kidneys is perhaps driving um, the uric acid uh uh, the formation of high levels of uric acid that's driving the, the low-grade inflammation. If uric acid is being transported into the kidney cell, can it have these signaling effects uh, that are similar or, or in parallel to what we see on an intracellular um, um, basis? And, and the, the answer is apparently yes, at least based on this in vitro data. 
So let's see what these guys found when they looked at this. And I summarized the data here. So the first thing is, if you have circulating uric acid or uric acid that, that's sitting there in a relatively high concentration outside the cell, how does it get in? Well, the, they found that the urat, the urat one uh, transporter was functional in this, right? And we've talked about urat one before. In fact, it exists in the chondrocyte. It 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 is found uh, um, in in other organ systems as well. So the uric acid can be transferred uh, into into the particular organ. And they found when they used inhibitors that they could. Uh, push down on the effects of, of the uric acid from inside the cell. So one thing that they found was that the hyperuricemia could drive uh, apoptosis. And what this means in English is that it could cause proximal cell death. When they inhibited the ability of urate 1 to transport uric acid into the proximal cell, they could at attenuate those results. In other words, they could shut down the apoptosis of the proximal cell. Next, they saw that the input of uric acid from outside the cell to inside the proximal cell caused uh, systemic inflammation, which, which we've talked about endlessly with this business, right? An elevation of systemic inflammation. Uh, um, just let me quickly respond to a com com comment here. Um, So we see the input of the uric acid. We see an elevation of systemic inflammation. Uh, the, two, the two proteins I want to talk about here, um, it, it causes, in this cell system, it causes the elevation of MAP kinase, which is instrumental in attracting and causing the infiltration of monocytes into, uh, into the, the kidney in order to deal with the inflammation. Um, we also see, and you guys have seen this before, right? The elevation of junk one, in this case, junk one and two. And we know that junk one is a transcription factor that's sitting on top of the inflammational cascade. We also, I've shown data in many presentations here that there was a 2017 paper that showed the involvement of junk one in the formation of inflammasomes, specifically in the initiation for the formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, which we know is one of the inflammasomes uh, taking a slight tangent here that's involved in the formation of a gout flare. Where do we see it now? In the kidney proximal cells. Granted, these are human uh, proximal kidney cells in tissue culture. We see the elevation of the junk proteins. Specifically, with uric acid coming from the circulatory system into the proximal tubule cell, we see the elevation of the uh, uric acid dependent reactive oxygen species, the elevation of the NADPH oxidase system producing more reactive oxygen species. We see, and this is the first time I've ever talked about this, we see the elevation in kidney proximal cells of a protein called BAX, which causes mitochondrial dysfunction by interrupting the membrane potential there. And when we, in, when we interrupt the membrane potential of the mitochondria, uh, what happens is the electron transport is not going to be running and or running correctly, let's just say, right? And if it can't run, now what we've done is dysregulated the mitochondria so that it moves away from producing ATP or burning, right? Burning fuel sources to make ATP and we're favoring lipogenesis now uh, in, the, in the cell. And then lastly, and I've left things out of this list to make things more simple. We elevate the production of a protein called caspase one, or excuse me, caspase nine. And its function is to initiate apoptosis or in English, cell death. So we see in, in this way how hyperuricemia can affect directly the health of the proximal tubule cells. And think, think down the road with this. If we're causing cell death 
and proximal cell tubes whose function it is to reabsorb uric acid and also to control excretion that down the road, this could contribute uh, to the hyperuricemia problem in an individual like me, for example, who, um, who was a gout sufferer, put my gout in remission, but now I'm still hyperuricemic. And don't forget, there's 43 million people walking around out there that are hyperuricemic who don't suffer from gout, right? What's the condition of their kidney? That's a question. And how important is this process to them in order to bring the uricemia down? And how far do we want to bring it down, right? Let's bring this full circle all the way back. Because we know about the antioxidant effects. I'm not arguing against that or what the literature says about that. But what I'm asking is, how much is too much? And this question of being able to bring it down and how did it get up there in the first place? So remember, we have the production effect and we have the excretion effect. Now, I want to bring to your attention for those people that are interested in this. And again, the person that reached out to me on my YouTube channel was asking the question about, can you elevate the excretion of, of uric acid? And I've done some research into that. Remember, this is the first presentation I've given on the hyperuricemia versus the antioxidant issue. And again, you've got to be careful when you go out into the literature. And there's a lot of conflict out there. But I found this one paper that showed that if you alkanize the, the um, excuse me, if you alkanize the urine, and this study in particular looked at potassium citrate in combination with somebody that was on allopurinol at a concentration between 100 and 200 mg a day, which is what I'm on. And they saw that that treatment, and I've highlighted the effects here. When you look at this study, I would encourage you to do that. I felt like it was well done. There were decent controls. It's one study. Does that mean this is the enchilada? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that there potentially needs to be more work here? Of course. But I was asked the question, what about the citrate issue? And here is a study I think is good. And you can see the highlights. It increased urine pH. And by the way, people, I am messing with this right now. I will have more on that in further presentations. And potassium citrate does in fact at least in my N1, back this up. You see an increase in urine pH, about a full unit. For, in my system, from 5.5 to about 6.5. Uh, is there a greater uric? Uh, their study shows that there's an increase in uric acid excretion. I don't know the answer to that. Their paper shows a positive result along those lines. And therefore, there, there is a reduction in serum ur uric acid uh, uh, levels. So this is out there for you. Remember, anything that you're going to do on your own relative to metabolic science should be in the supervision of a doctor. I have a PhD in biochemistry. biochemistry. I'm not a medical physician. So make sure that you talk with them about uh, you know, that you do this under supervision, I would read the paper carefully. Um, be really careful about what you're hearing out there on the superficial um, internet about this. Don't just buy a bunch of potassium citrate and start horfing it down, right? Talk to your doctor about it, read this paper, and then make intelligent decisions about what you put in your mouth or don't put in your mouth. Okay. And with that, I'm going to conclude the presentation. I, I want to thank everyone for um, for being here. I hope that you enjoyed uh, the content today. Um, um, and with that, uh, I'm going to stay here for another minute or two uh, to see if there are any questions. I've had one person chiming in so far this morning. Everybody is welcome. Ask anything that you want. Uh, I am doing some supplements. I've uh, The last video was, was in that area. So again, I spent a year a uh, year and a half, actually, um, in the ketogenic diet before I saw my uric acid come back down um, uh, without 
allopurinol or any supplements, my uric acid was between seven and eight. Um, I, I experimented a lot with alcohol. Um, I experimented a lot with glycemia, um, looking at the effects on me. And I realize out there in my defense that, uh, that N1s don't mean anything. But I feel very strongly that when I give these presentations, I, I want to focus exclusively on science that was peer reviewed, that lend uh, hope to those of us that are trying to reverse um, chronic disease, uh, metabolic chronic disease, number one. And number two, I, I never tell you guys anything that I haven't done on myself because as a leader in this field, I don't believe in leading if I'm not willing to, to do the same stuff. So I try it. I see what happens with me. And I tell you about that. Just remember, you have your own metabolic system. You're, you're an individual. We don't have this, the same exact genetics. And how you respond to a metabolic environment most likely is not going to be the same as me. And even with the supplements um, that, that I have now, and you'll see in the show notes, I, I make a lot of suggestions there. These are things that have worked for me, but they might not work for you. And I've always advocated testing. Uh, when you try a supplement, testing your fasting glucose, um, also the glucose before and after the supplement ketones before and after the supplement and uric acid with a uric acid meter before and after the supplement. Um, because these are supplements, they're, they're not FDA approved. And, the, you know, they put stuff in those packing materials and so on. And how you react to those is going to be individual to you. I might not have an effect on me, or I might get the effect that I want without the wrong effects. But when you try it, it may not work out exactly. So to finish, I am taking 200 milligrams total of allopurinol a day. I have been able to reduce that amount from 600 a day. I take 100 in the morning with my first meal, and I take 100 uh, in the late afternoon with my second meal. I am now also uh, taking tart cherry in combination with the allopurinol and cure Seton. And I have found with the addition of those two supplements, along with the allopurinol, number one, I've been able to reduce my allopurinol. And, and secondly, I've been able to get my average uric acid from uh, between seven and eight, seven and a half, whatever, if you will, you want to cut hairs, uh, down to between five and six. And I am stable there. The only factor that I have seen so far in me that disrupts this is if I start having even small amounts of alcohol. So if I have a single 2.6 carb beer in the late afternoon with my dinner, if I do that two or three days in a row, I see a steady uh, elevation in my uric acid. That's the truth of the matter. Um, and this is consistent with what the literature says, that this survival switch is activatable, right? Once you start activating it, uh, that it becomes seemingly more sensitive to the, to the ingestion of that material. And that's what it looks like in me. So um, buyer beware out there. Just consider this stuff, all right? Now I have a question. Give me a second to read it. Okay, uh, so here, let me put the question up on the screen. Sorry about that, guys. All right. Now, the, the answer to this, I believe, is yes. I think you're absolutely right because um, we lost the ability to break uric acid down about 24 million years ago. It actually, it was a series of, of mutations that resulted in our... our, our um, non-ability to break uric acid down into, you know, um, what, what amounts to at high concentrations, right? Toxic, uh, non-toxic, um, final products that can be excreted in the urine. Uh, we lost the ability to do that about 24 million years ago, but it was a series of mutations. I think that started 
before that. And then the alcohol component came in about 10 to 14 million years ago. It's important for me to state this up front. Um, the alcohol and the ability to metabolize fructose, therefore, were enhanced with this uh, significant rise in uric acid um, bet between 10 and 24 million years ago, the alcohol and the fructose are, ru are riding on the same bus, people. Now, why is it proposed that this happened? Well, if you think about hunter-gatherers, right, they moved from one food source to the next. And it, it was very important when we were sitting on a food source. And I, I don't want to get into these irrational ar arguments over, you know, what what it is we are eating exactly you know the plant people like to yell at the other people you know the meat people that it was one way or another but truthfully and i used to teach survival when i was in my late teens and early 20s i got news for you you eat what you can get literally and if it's plant food by god you're going to eat it why because you're hungry uh, and it's hard work to eat this way i've, I've experienced it um and I'm, I'm sure our hunter and gatherer ancestors were much better at it than I ever was, right? But my point is, when they ate, it was an advantage to us if you could maximize the conversion of those incoming calories, carbohydrate, protein, and fat into the formation of calorie storage, glycogen, and de novo lipogenesis to production of new fat that was stored. That way, when you left that food source carrying with you what you could and you moved to the next one, you had adequate calories to make it to this next food source. So yes, I believe it was evolutionary, evolutionarily important to us. What's going on in this day and age is that people are eating this way chronically uh, in the standard American diet uh, five to six meals a day, day in, day out, week in, week out. You're getting the picture decade after decade, right? And that survival mechanism was not meant to be activated every single day. It's clear and simple. It's not meant to be activated 24 hours a day. And that's what's getting us into trouble with diabetes, the obesity, um, the, the people that end up coming out with gout on, on, on the other end of this. Um, and then, by the way, it's not just about the humans. If you look at all of the other animals that are out there, uh, they function in a similar way. They, they operate in nature different than us. I'm not saying we're the same as a bear, but a bear utilizes that pathway in a very similar fashion. Or I should say the humans use that pathway in a very similar way to bears because in the fall, when they're getting ready to hibernate, why do they why? is their strategy is to hibernate. Why do they hibernate? Because during the winter, right, food sources are scarce. So what a better way to get through that than to sleep through it, right? That's, that's an excellent strategy. But what do they do in the fall? Man, they go crazy on ripe berries and food sources that, that are high in fructose. And the consequence of this is that they put on fat weight very fast. And what are they doing? They're building that way up, right? So that when they go to hibernate, that they are able to get through the winter on, they're going to be burning all winter. That's what's going to go on. The mitochondria are going to be cranking out the energy they need to sleep through the winter. And what happens when they wake up? Well, their system is going, hey, dude. We're almost out of calories. Wake up, right? And all of their foraging behaviors, uh, their aggression, they're cranky, just like we are when we get really, really hungry. Think about that. When we get really hungry, it's like, you know, I need to find some food. I need to eat right now. And, and if you're one of these guys like me that tends to go hypoglycemic, or at least I did in my past before I went ketogenic, uh, you're cranky and you're grumpy, you're snapping at people and so on. Not so different than the bear when they come out of hibernation. And there's a lot of other 
when you go out into the animal kingdom and uh, Dr. Richard Johnson uh, is really good at this, going outside his own field to look at this stuff. You can read about it in Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. Uh, he talks a lot about these other animal systems that are functioning on this pathway for this very reason. When they're eating these high fructose uh, meals and hyperglycemia, they're shunting all that incoming calorie into producing fat. And this is how they survive what they got to do. There's some hummingbirds, for example, that migrate thousands and thousands of miles. How are they doing that? Before the trip, they optimize this pathway. They put away tons and tons and tons of fat. Then they go for their flight. And, and if they don't get enough fat stored, I got news for you, man. They just die, right? Because they, uh, they run out of fuel and they just collapse into the ocean. And that's the end of that. So this is a very important path, pathway in animal systems, we're, we're not alone. We, we're unique in the nuances in how we utilize this pathway. And how this we get into trouble with this pathway is in the chronic activation of it. And when you think about today's presentation, we were focused on the kidney. This pathway exists in all the cells of our body. Why? Because of our genetics. And I'm not arguing that the pathway is being activated the same in every single organ. I'm not saying that at all, right? I, I talked about that today. The liver is different than the kidney. They have different functions. You wouldn't expect the survival switch to be activated exactly the same way in the liver as you would in the kidney. And similarly, when we talk about the gout hypothesis, we don't expect the chondrocyte to be activating and, and then dealing with the consequences of this pathway in exactly the same thing, or ex excuse me, in exactly the same way. And what I find really fascinating about today's presentation is the issue that uric acid coming in because of concentration gradients inside a cell can elicit these inflammational uh, signaling pathways. This again, explains so much about why we are suffering from chronic disease. If we're running hyperuricemia above certain levels, right? And what are those levels? I, I don't know. We need, we need more data on this, right? How far, where is the optimum antioxidant effect? That's where we want to be as a human, right? Evolutionarily, that's where we want to be. And then how far above that are some of us? And what is the best way for us to get the hyperuricemia down uh, in, into this range that's beneficial for us, but not outside the range where it's causing problems? Um, and with that, I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and close. Uh, I really appreciate all of you uh, being here today. Uh, and listening. And uh, please, if you're interested in making comments or you have questions and you're too shy to do it in a live show, uh, you can go on to my uh, um, YouTube channel, Dr. Pete's Keto Club, and um, pose your questions there. And as all my viewers know, I, I usually get back to you within um, 24 hours. So thank, thanks again for being here. I really appreciate you guys a lot for your support. And I'll see you next week, either through a pre-produced video or another live show.